Hello YouTube, welcome to another lecture on Iron Medicine PA YouTube channel. Today's lecture is on toxins, antinutrients, and how to avoid them. This also comes timely on the Fluoride Awareness Week. So let's get into it right here. So this is an interesting article I saw on The Lancet, um, kind of putting forth the theory that there is more to the worldwide epidemic of metabolic dysfunction and autoimmune disease rather than just excess calorie consumption or sedentarism. Um, so we want to look at what is causing this, what is causing this increased chronic disease. And it's possibly and most likely accumulation of many toxins, so heavy metals, organophosphates, so poisons, um, toxic oils, and many things. Uh, these autoimmune diseases and metabolic dysfunction, there's just, there's, there has to be a reason towards why we're seeing such increased rates over a, a relatively short uh, human history. Let's start with the great debate of folic acid versus folate. Back in 1998, the FDA mandated that folic acid be put in the food system. Uh, they haven't monitored safety ever since they've done this. Now, the term folate and folic acid are often used interchangeably, but they are not the same thing. Folate, or uh, methyl, uh, tetrahydrofolate, is an organic compound that's found in liver is found in leafy greens this is the folate that we want it helps us methylate our dna now folic acid is a synthetically derived substance that has a much higher bioavailability now there's discussion among the literature and kind of conflicting discussion as to what this folic acid does it is known that it does bind to the same receptors as folate does but it has a higher bioavailability so it binds better now, is this good or bad? If you think of it the way Dr. Ben Lynch thinks about it, who's a naturopathic physician, he says that folate then can't bind to the same receptors that folic acid binds to, and it blocks it from absorbing. So people could potentially develop a folate deficiency. Now, there has been correlational studies that have identified the increased risk of colon cancer with folic acid. Um, uh, maybe B12 deficiency related to folic acid supplementation. Initially, folic acid was suggested as a way to prevent neural tube defects in pregnant women. And this is a targeted subset of the population, so pregnant women at risk of developing neural tube defects in their children. They have extrapolated this to say that folic acid should be supplemented in all human beings, in all foods. Unfortunately, this is a human experiment to supplement the entire population. Extrapolating a very small subset of the population, namely pregnant women at risk of giving birth to children with neural tube defects, um, this is called extrapolating evidence and it's not supposed to be done in medicine. So the jury is still out as to what uh, folic acid really is doing to people. I would say try to get your folate from natural sources. That would probably be the best way to do it. Let's talk about another supplement that's not quite so natural, namely citric acid. It is not necessarily vitamin C. If you look at the ingredients list on any product you may buy on, at the store or a vitamin, it says citric acid or, or vitamin C in, and in parentheses, citric acid. Now, citric acid naturally exists in fruits and vegetables. However, it is not the naturally occurring citric acid, but the manufactured citric acid that is extensively used as a food and beverage additive. And 99% of the world's production of this citric acid is carried out using a fungus, Aspergillus niger. Now, Aspergillus niger is a common allergen. A lot of people have problems with this. You wouldn't want this growing on your ceiling. But we ingest it uh, in the form of synthetically derived citric acid. And potentially this could cause a lot of problems for people. All right, let's move on to phytic acid, the anti-nutrient in whole foods. Anti-nutrient is a nice term that is thrown around a lot. 
but let's talk about what this really is in a practical setting. So phytic acid is a covering that grains and some plants use to protect themselves, protect their seeds from digestion. You'll find these on whole grains, so your brown rice, you're trying to eat healthy, so you get the brown rice, right? Because you're, you're a health conscious person. Well, what you're getting there is a phytic acid covered grain. Now, phytic acid inhibits mineral absorption. It's inflammatory and can give some people some digestive problems. We can try to break down the phytic acid barrier by, well, eating white rice instead of brown rice or soaking your brown rice in um, uh, apple cider vinegar, possibly some probiotics, and that can help break down this natural plant barrier, this plant toxin. Or do what I do and just avoid grains altogether. Uh, nitrates and nitrates. This is another controversial one and the data is kind of out as to if these are harmful or even protective. I used to try to avoid these and I still try to avoid um, consuming too many of these nitrates. Um, this is based on some animal models that I've uh, read about in the literature, but in others, the, um, when we see how the the end form of nitric oxide, how it is produced, potentially nitrates and nitrates may have vasodilatory benefits, so decreasing blood pressure, and it is used therapeutically for this. So the jury is a bit out on this. Um, when you're looking at a meta-analysis of whether these things cause gastric cancer or not, hard to say. You know, these are epidemiological studies, a lot of confounding factors, jury is still out. I would bet on the safe side that if these are synthetically added to processed meats by industry, it's probably not a great thing. And that's just a hunch. And I would try to avoid consuming too many of these. Potentially, if you get them from natural sources, it's not a big deal. Now, natural sources, as you might have seen if you look at bacon ingredients, include celery. So you'll see that there's no nitrites added to bacon at the store, but it's actually celery powder. Now, celery has very high amounts of nitrites. Natural, right? But not all plants, um, not consuming plants isn't necessarily a healthier alternative. Plants are toxins, as we've seen just in the previous slide. So whether nitrites are protective or harmful, I can't say for certain. Uh, high fructose corn syrup, and this one's a pretty pretty simple one. We know this one's bad. We know to avoid this one, and it's in all your processed foods. Your ketchups, your Gatorades, even mustard. It's surprising what they put this in. Sometimes even vitamins have it. And there's increasing evidence that the, that the body metabolizes fructose differently from glucose, independently of insulin, and primarily in the liver, where it is converted into fat. So this may be contributing to the epidemic of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So you really have to pay attention and try to avoid the high fructose corn syrup. Gluten, another plant that uh, is probably problematic for a whole lot of people. So there's this, uh, there's this interesting pathophysiology that happens with gluten, uh, especially in the intestines. As, and it's associated with gut permeability and um, uh, gluten problems. So what happens is that the gluten will go in and it kind of opens up these junctions in these cell membranes or the, 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 between the cells, these cell junctions of our intestines, and it allows food particles to pass through into our bloodstream. Now what happens when food products, so really anything, it can be you know, a veggie, gluten, dairy, even meat. What happens when the particle goes through our intestines into our bloodstream? Well, our body responds to it like it's an invader and it attacks it. And probably the body then develops antibodies towards food products. And then people can develop autoimmune issues potentially or just indigestion issues or just weird chronic thing, maybe chronic fatigue, joint pain, you name it. If you have a problem with gluten, and many people do, and there's probably uh, a th threshold to uh, the amount of gluten that you have to consume to get this, maybe sometimes people, some people are very sensitive, it only takes a little bit, other people it takes a lot. Um, uh, people who have 
uh, inflammatory bowel diseases should really pay attention to gluten and really think about what that might be doing to them. This is not really well appreciated in conventional medicine, uh, but is an increasingly understood, even among uh, mainstream providers, that gluten causes a lot of problems. Maybe not so much on the autoimmune spectrum uh, consensus, but with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, it, it is um, regularly understood as, as a problem. So gluten, one to most likely cut out of the diet. So cow milk, kind of controversial, A1 and A2 milk proteins. You've probably never heard of these. And that's because the most common cow in the U.S. is um, the A1 type of milk. And you've probably gone to Walmart and seen A2 milk and not understood what that is. Well, it's a milk that is potentially better digested and may give people less problems. Now, there's been epidemiological evidence that uh, supports uh, the theory that consuming beta casein A1 is associated with higher natural mortality rates from ischemic heart disease. So that's kind of significant there. And the tricky part is finding a good source of cow milk. Most people just cut it out altogether because it's too difficult to find one that's um, a healthy alternative. Um, some people believe consuming a raw milk, a raw A2 milk would probably be best. Uh, I found that I enjoy that one best and it agrees with me best. And unfortunately, if you get an unpasteurized milk, it has a very short shelf life and it's a bit inconvenient. Let's go on to fluoride. So National Fluoride Awareness Week. Uh, let's talk about that. So in the study of chemistry, it is known that fluorine exists in the same column as iodine. Now, iodine is an essential component of a healthy thyroid. Theoretically, fluorine would bind to the same receptor where iodine would bind and thus inhibit thyroid function. Now typically tap water has a 0 0.7 to 1.2 parts per million of fluorine and the CDC recommends this to prevent tooth decay in children and advise even tablet supplementation for children not on tap water systems. I disagree with this wholeheartedly and I think this is harmful. There are human and animal studies that show that fluorine and fluoride is harmful. Rat models demonstrate learning disability and generational consequences of high fluoride intake in water at 100 parts per million. Now granted, that is a bit more than what is currently in our tap water sources. But if you look at what other countries have done, so I know back where I lived in Germany and Berlin, fluoride was banned from the water system. Uh, so there's other countries that have figured this out but unfortunately, the U.S. still fluorinates its water supply system based on this ill-conceived notion that you need fluoride for healthy teeth. A case control study in Iran looked at fluoride in tap water on humans. Cases tend to have higher TSH, so thyroid stimulating hormone, which is a hormone that you can measure on lab values. And if it's increased, that pretty much tells you that your thyroid isn't functioning properly. So the cases with the higher TSH value uh, had higher fluoride concentrations in their tap water system. What the study did in Iran, like, they looked at regions of the city where there were higher proportions of fluoride in the tap water, and then they looked at the TSH values, and they saw a correlation between uh, impaired thyroid function and increased fluorination of the water. So let's go on further with fluoride as it relates to the diabetic. There's a large body of evidence of the harms associated with fluoride. You can click on that link and look at the very lengthy art, um, article on that. Now, fluoride could be a low dose endocrine disruptor. Fluoride directly reduces insulin synthesis in rats. Microcirculatory defects, increased capillary permeability and altered protein biosynthesis in the pancreas is associated with fluoride exposure. And the fact that fluoride causes hypothyroidism also exacerbates the damage to diabetics, the reduction in peripheral glucose metabolism. So there's a lot of reasons towards why we would want to reduce our fluoride consumption and never try to supplement with fluoride. Vegetables. So as we've said before, most plants on earth are toxic to humans in a large quantity. Now, there's some that are less toxic and there's some compounds such as these phytonutrients that people in the longevity uh, side of medicine are interested in as potentially life extensors. But unfortunately, many plants are toxins. They developed 
defense mechanisms to protect themselves. We've discussed the phytic acid. Now we have to talk about why these plants may be toxic, maybe not for natural reasons, but unnatural reasons. So unfortunately, if you're consuming uh, vegetables that you bought at your local Costco or um, you know Aldi's, these are conventionally raised. And if you looked at my previous slide on fluorine, or fluorine and fluoride, you'll understand how dangerous this is. Unfortunately, our plants are sprayed with cryolite, which is a colorless mineral made up of fluoride, sodium, and aluminum. And aluminum is quite toxic to humans as well. Uh, this cryolite is sprayed on the vegetables and fruits in warehouses with a gas fumigant. And it makes it impossible to wash off this veggie. So those little five seconds you wash your apple off underneath the sink does nothing to draw out the cryolite that is impregnated in your apple. Another big problem with conventional raised veggies is that they're mineral depleted. So you may look at this beautiful green, let's take it broccoli that you bought off the store, and it looks green and it looks healthy. But this is because it has been grown in a an environment that never would have uh, it never would have existed before. So it's grown in Monsanto seeds, and the seeds are specifically designed to grow in a chemical environment of pesticides and fluoride and glyphosate, uh, so that pests don't eat it. Now, if the pests aren't eating the broccoli, this is a problem. You know that it's poisonous, uh, and you don't want to eat something that the insects aren't eating, essentially. So vegetables and seed oils, we've talked about seed oils before on this channel. Uh, the old dogma that saturated fats are harmful is regarded as false by the American College of Carniology. However, we still see ubiquitous use of vegetable and seed oils, and they're supposedly healthier or less harmful to human health. This, the opposite is true, and polyunsaturated fats in the form of these vegetable and seed oils are harmful, and they can result in a wide variety of problems. Let's look at an interesting chart here. We can see the estimated annual per capita consumption of foods between 1909 and 1999. We can see that your animal fats that the American College of Cardiology used to say is harmful, that pretty much has stayed the same, maybe even decreased over time. But you can see the soy consumption has exponentially increased since 1959. So why the American College of Cardiology would associate saturated fats from uh, beef and uh, animals as being pathogenic, I don't understand. If you just look at this chart, you would try to make the association, if you're going to make an association at all, and you shouldn't make associations of healthy epidemiological graphs, but if you are, you would see that the increase in vegetable oils and soy potentially caused this cause this increase in cardiovascular disease. Um, yes, so we have to also take into account what the chicken farmers use. So chicken farmers are well, are well aware that soy and vegetable oils uh, makes the chicken fatter. So you put the soy oil in the chicken feed and it makes the broilers gain weight. Now, why don't we extrapolate this towards humans. We see humans increasing their consumption of vegetable oils and increasing their weight over this time period. Chickens and the humans, they probably are affected the same way by soybean oil consumption and canola oil. We have to also talk about the omega-3 and omega-6 imbalance. There's a new theory that this imbalance and a trend towards higher omega-6 causes inflammation and metabolic dysfunction. And our goal is here to reduce our omega-6 consumption. So eliminating your canola oils, your cottonseed oils, your soybean oils, getting rid of those, get them out of the diet, and increase your omega-3. That means eating the whole egg. Yes, eating yolk and the whites together, eating fish, eating meats, eating your saturated fats. That's going to help you increase your omega-3s. And here's a nice little chart here showing the highest omega-6 we can see actually palm kernel oils here at the top 
as well as coconut oil. And I, I used to think coconut oil was healthy. That's a very high omega-6 component. You can see avocado oil is pretty high. And, uh, safflower oil, canola oil is pretty high. Your soybean oil, that's pretty high as well. Oh, it increases towards the bottom. Here we go. So coconut oil would be the least. Okay, so maybe it's not as bad. I can keep my coconut oil. We can see grapeseed oil and cottonseed oil has perhaps the highest amount of omega-6. Uh, all right. What else do we have here? Ah, uh, yes, your feedlot finished meat. So I'd say if you can't afford the grass finished meat, you're better off still eating meat rather than grains. But ideally, you want to get grass finished. But especially if you're trying to do what this channel promotes and trying to incorporate organ meats into your diet, you don't want to be eating a grain-finished beef liver. And it's a bit disturbing what is happening. 20%, if not up to 60% of grain-fed and finished cattle have liver abscesses. It is such a huge problem that the farm industry is trying to develop a vaccine to fix it and feed more antibiotics to cows. So there's five antibiotics that are commonly used to prevent liver abscesses in cows. That's uh, bacitrecin methylene, disilicylate, uh, oxytetracycline, which is a tetracycline antibiotic, a couple of these, Virginia mycin, uh, very interesting. These are all approved for the prevention of liver abscesses in feedlot cattle. Uh, so a huge problem if we're trying to eat organ meats, we really have to avoid the grain finished livers. I just, we don't want to be consuming, consuming livers that are full of abscesses. Um, we talked a bit about thyroid toxins earlier. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, excess dietary iodine, so your common table salts, these are often impregnated with iodine, supposedly because if you get sea salt, it has iodine, def it's iodine deficient, so it's supposedly not as good for you. Perhaps the opposite is true, and that consuming these table salts with excess added dietary iodine are potentially problematic. We can see in genetically susceptible individuals, increased consumption of iodine can act as a trigger for thyroiditis. So naturally occurring goitrogens, these are legumes, so your beans, plants, amiodarin, and lithium, these are uh, drugs used often in cardiac and psychiatric conditions. Cabbage, cauliflower, so your cruciferous vegetables, these are often uh, anti-thyroids. Soy and soy-enriched foods can give you thyroid problems as well. Uh, let's see, cyanogenic plant foods, yes, we've talked about these. So, um, All right, so that pretty much covers your thyroid toxins. Environmental toxins on thyroid health. So yes, so organocholine. So you'll find a lot of these in your, in your, um, as a conventionally raised agriculture, cosmetics. So UV filters, so using sunscreen. These are often full of problems. And these, anything that you put on your skin is gonna be absorbed right into your bloodstream. So you read that ingredient list on your sunscreens and think if you would want that in your skin. Potentially some of these are thyroid and endocrine disruptors. Heavy metals like cadmium, these affect the thyroid as well. So uh, PCBs found in plastics, we try to avoid plastics. These are not only uh, um, sex hormone disruptors, but thyroid hormone disruptors as well. Um, let's see, what else do we have here? If my slides will shift. Ah, tea and iron deficiency. This is not one that not a lot of people know about. But green teas and a lot of teas can inhibit iron absorption and cause iron deficiency. So if you're a Brit and you enjoy your tea and consuming like 12 glasses of that a day and your iron are low and you're confused as to why your iron is low, you might want to look at your tea consumption. The other big problem, especially if you're buying tea from overseas, you're getting from China, is that it's full of fluoride sometimes even aluminum and these are two toxins we try to avoid our aluminum and fluoride burden is so high on the human body and the higher your aluminum and fluoride burden is the more problems you're going to get so um, these 
<clears throat> aluminum fluorides, especially in the teas. Now, you can get fluoride from all sorts of sources, especially of the vegetables that we consume. But if you're getting in tea, there's a very high proportion in black teas and green teas, oolong teas. So try to limit those or get a better source of tea. Glyphosate and Roundup used on plants. Yes, huge problem. This is a uh, potentially a DNA disruptor. And uh, conventional cultivation and agriculture uses this um, way too much. Unfortunately, uh, the Mexican workers that are uh, recruited to um, uh, work on the fields, they will often develop terrible cancers. And this is most likely from their exposure to glyphosate and Roundup used on plants. So unfortunately, these poor immigrant workers are brought in, they're paid uh, uh, less than minimum wage, and they're undocumented workers. And a lot of them develop very odd blood cancers related to glyphosate. Terrible, terrible thing. Um, so this is the summary of everything we talked about. Folic acid, we try to eliminate that. I'd say citric acid, get rid of that. Try to get natural sources of uh, vitamin C. And we don't need a whole lot. Uh, you're not going to develop uh, gout. It, it doesn't happen anymore. You can get, actually, vitamin C from natural sources in liver, in heart, kidney. You don't need to take a supplement of vitamin C. Phytic acid, you're going to find this on all your grains, uh, unless you're shelling your grains or you're soaking them in a probiotic overnight. Fluoride, it's in our water, it's in our teas, it's in our fruits and veggies. It's sucked up through the roots and it's sprayed on them to help them grow in Roundup and help them store in warehouses. Uh, gluten and whole grains and phytic acid, we discussed that. Cow milk, A1 type of milk uh, that is common in the cow breeds across the U.S. can be problematic for humans. Try to pick up an A2 milk and try that if you can. Uh, we talked about vegetables uh, grown in Roundup and glyphosate. It's an endocrine disruptor. It's an increased risk of cancer and decreases testosterone. Omega-6 oils, we try to reduce ours in a diet. Uh, they're, they're absolutely everywhere. Every time you go out to eat, you know they are frying these, uh, whatever you're eating in the restaurant, they're frying it in one-week-old soybean or vegetable oil. You're guaranteed. I have not come across a restaurant yet that is not using these. Um, so yeah, sorry, you can't eat fries at the restaurant anymore. Uh, not good. Hope you all enjoyed this lecture. Uh, you probably uh, are like, oh dang, I can't eat anything at this point. No, it's not true. It's just really hard. If you have a problem, it, you really need to look at your, your pantry and think about what you're eating. Um, again, I'm always available on ironmedicinepa.com. I'd be more than happy to guide you through the complexities of toxins and diet and work on uh, fixing your lifestyle. Um, hope you all enjoyed. See you next time.